Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. I'm so excited to be talking to my guest this week. He is the best bantamweight fighter in the world. He is the UFC bantamweight champion, Al Jermaine Sterling. Al Joe, how you doing, my man? Doing well. Doing great. Back in Vegas, getting some sunshine. Uh, just had a little big hay, so now it's back to uh, getting the body back in order. I hear you. So let us talk about that. Obviously, you're coming off a massive win, in many people's opinions, a legacy-defining win over Henry Cejudo. How have you been enjoy- enjoying your time since that victory? Um, I've been enjoying my time by getting ready for another fight. <laughs> 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 so as you can see, not not much enjoying, just a little bit. But um, yeah, it is what it is, you know? So uh, life's good. I can't, I can't complain. And uh I guess I'm I'm happy where everything is at right now, you know. So um just taking it one day at a time. Let's go back to UFC 288 for a second there. You obviously get your hand raised in victory. Were you aware that the UFC were gonna bring in Sugar Sean O'Malley into the cage after the fight was a, was going to end? No, I, I had no clue. I had no clue. So that kind of caught me off guard, but uh I know we just merged with the WWE, so I guess it's right on par, I guess now. Right. Now looking back in retrospect, would you have it uh in you know, would you have liked to enjoy the moment, the celebration in New Jersey with the fans and just embrace that moment for what it was and perhaps have the 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 Sean O'Malley face off or the announcement or whatever the situation there is currently take place after the fact? Or can now can you look back on it and say, okay, I can understand from a pro- promotional aspect why that would have made sense. Where where do you where does your opinion lie on that? Yeah, I mean, I understand the promotion aspect of it. It's it's selling the next fight, and I think if uh, I think if you had to grade that, I think we did pretty good with that. And it wasn't like it was forced or fake or anything like that. I mean, I, I can't speak on O'Malley, but I know for me, it's after a fight, the adrenaline is pumping, and I'm just like, I almost, I was like so close to like ripping the chain off of his neck. I was like, control yourself, don't be a complete animal but uh because if i did that we probably i would hope we probably would have been fighting right then and there if not then i don't know sean's got some uh soul searching to do let's talk about the result for a second i've i've called it a legacy defining result and win for you how do you look back at that performance and the win over henry versus some of the other big milestone victories you've had in your career man in terms of like fight iq Wanting everything that you could want from a mixed martial arts standpoint, um, conditioning, technique, uh, skill set, you know, it's just everything from strength, uh, just seeing all varieties of stuff, seeing me work a little bit of BJJ, seeing some of my my funkiness, my scrambling ability. You got the wrestling aspect. You got to see the, the Olympic gold medalist get taken down by the D3 wrestler um, that could. <laughs> And uh, you got to see some striking as well. So I think you kind of got the blend of everything that you could want and ask for in an MMA competition. So in terms of me rating that, I think it's it's at the pinnacle of my career in in regards to all the other fights, just because of the accolades and how much was on the line for the both of us, not just for me potentially breaking the record um, and not just for Henry coming back and doing the unthinkable that most people are not really able to do coming back from three years is hard to do. I think he might have thought he was John Jones when he had to remember. No, you're Henry Cejudo in a much more stacked weight class compared to heavyweight and light heavyweight. You know what I mean? And that's not a slight at John by any means. It's just the reality of things. The lighter guys tend to have more skill pound for pound. And you look through all of us from the the from champion all the way down to like top twenty. Overall, most of us are pretty well-rounded in comparison to those other weight classes that are bigger than us. So, yeah, you had two of the best guys to ever do it. So, for me, um, taking a guy out like that, and this split decision nonsense is so crazy to me because I felt like we both knew after the fight who won the fight. It it wasn't a question. It was like, yeah, I think I got it. It wasn't like, and even like I know Marvin Vittori and Israel Adesanya, like, after that fight, and this is not picking on Marvin, but for some reason, he thought he won that fight. I'm sure when he went back and watched it, he probably realized, like, ah, it wasn't as close as I thought it was. Where this one is just like, dude, 
Come on, bro. We both know. Look in my eyes, and you can tell who's the captain now. You can tell who's in the dry uh, seat right now. And I had it four to one going back after I went back and watched it. I was like, at worst, I was like three to two. But then I went back and watched. It. I was like, no, this is easily four to one. But I mean, it is what it is. So to me, all the other wins, the Pedion thing was more hype than anything because everyone was on the Yan train because the UFC machine does that. Um, the TJ Dillashaw thing, he came back, beat a tough Corey Sanhagen. But for me, like as an analyst, as a competitor, the way I break down the fights, I'm the one that's getting in there and I can see what's what and be honest with myself and my abilities versus their abilities and see where the trouble is going to lie. And for me, on paper, this was by far the most competitive fight that I could have in the division right now. Yeah, I had Henry on my show and kind of he kind of shared his thoughts on the scorecards. But what's amazing is his some of his recent comments and quotes. You know, to hear him call you the greatest bantamweight of all time. You know, forget the result and forget the the split decision, the, any any controversy, debate, whatever. But now that enough time has passed and he can reflect back on the result, the fact that you won and he's calling you the goat bantamweight, how do you how do you take that, man? It's uh, it's it's cool to hear from a guy like Henry because he doesn't really give those type of compliments, especially to guys in his weight class. At least that's the way I feel. And um, you know, I'm not trying to be like arrogant or anything, but it's I'll just leave it at that. I think it's cool for him to acknowledge and say something like that. I know that's not something for me to debate. It's up to the fans and the the consensus for them to kind of go out there and do their own research. I'm comfortable in my own skin. I'm comfortable with my record and my accolades and everything I've achieved thus far. So um, if people want to put me in that conversation, great. If not, hey, life's still good. Like my life doesn't change whether or not I'm in that conversation or not. You know, uh, at the end of the days, <laughs> numbers don't lie, you know. So um, my my whole thing with that conversation has always been, well, I feel like the WEC wins should count. With the UFC wins the same way Strike Force wins were counted with the UFC merger. So if you look at it like that, then I, I feel like I still got some work to do. But other than that, I'm out here doing the damn thing, man. And it is what it is, man. We're gonna keep on grinding, keep adding more to the resume. And the next the next stop is uh the the sugar factory and uh removing all those cavities, man, and uh getting it done to add one more to the to the hit list. Yeah, you kind of mentioned, you know, the, the stats and the numbers don't lie. You know, most wins in UFC bantamweight history, longest active win streak in UFC bantamweight history. And you talked about Sugar Sean O'Malley. Is it official? Like, have you signed a contract? Is this all going down at UFC 292 in Boston on August 19th? Man, if I tell you guys when I signed these other contracts, like the actual date of when I signed them, like the contract is all formality type of thing. So when people look at that, I think people are looking too deep into what that actually is. It's it's not like the contract doesn't really mean anything. I say I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight. You know what I mean? Uh, literally signing the contract to me doesn't really matter much. It's just more of a like legally binding versus anything. If that makes more sense. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, well, well, as of right now, the, that's that's the fight. What does a win over Sean O'Malley do for your career, for your legacy? We talked about Henry Cejudo and you talk about some of the other wins you've had in the past. What's at stake here for you? Obviously, what's at stake for him is to become a UFC bantamweight champion. But what does a, a win over he, uh, Sugar Sean O'Malley do for you? I think it just adds another notch in the belt. That's that's really it. It's not like this this name in particular is just a very popular name with the young kids who are playing Fortnite and things like that. Kids that like to sit home, smoke weed, and tattoo their faces. Um, so that generation of people that you know, kind of like the rebels, I guess. Um, in terms of what it does for me. I mean, the Henry win versus the O'Malley win is two completely different things. One is just a competition. The other one is a competition and legacy and accolades. The other one is more just competition and maybe eyeball value. That's that's really it. But in the sense of sport, um, he's still a young buck in this game. Whether or not he's been tested, I, I think we got to give him the nod now with the, the win over Piotr Jan 
And although I still, I'm like, I watched that fight again and I kind of gave the nod to Piotr after watching it again. I'm just like, I don't know. I think that one is actually a split decision because I feel like depending on what you're looking at could kind of sway your perception or decision on who you think should get the nod. It was a very close fight. And I think the Sugar Show has arrived. But again, there's levels to this man. He hasn't fought anyone who's a high level grappler. He hasn't fought anyone of his same size. He hasn't fought someone who's as strong as him or stronger, I should say. And I think when he steps in there with a beast like myself, it's going to be completely different. He's going to realize really, really quickly that, as I say what it is, it's there's levels to this. Um, he can say whatever he wants about my striking and you better, you look like shit tonight. You better look better than that. Hey, there's a reason why everyone looks at me on tape and they think what they think. And as soon as that cage door locks and we lock up, it's completely different. What looks like it's going to be an easy target. It's a lot harder for them to hit in real time. And I think that's the difference. It might not look pretty when you're watching it from your seats, but there's something special happening in there. And me and my opponents, we always tend to see and figure that out. And Sean's going to be no different. When he gets in there with me, he's going to realize I'm harder to hit than he thought and harder to hit than he expected. He's going to realize that I'm stronger than he expected. And uh, I'm as good as I say I am. Have you been impressed with what he's been able to do outside of the cage in terms of the marketability, you know, building his name, building his brand. You know, there's a lot of fighters out there in various divisions that are on like six, seven, eight fight win streaks that aren't sniffing a title shot. And I think Sugar Sean O'Malley has been able to do a lot of that with the the persona and the personality that he's built here with you. I, I don't even know what persona that is, man. I listen to him talk and some of the stuff and, and it's just this bland monotone thing and i'm like i don't see what the hype is isn't this him and connor what people were comparing him oh he's the next connor i'm like where there is nothing what connor brings to the table in terms of persona wittiness charisma sean doesn't have any of that the only thing he has is a, a i guess an exciting fight style because he's a stand-up artist but when's the last time he actually ko'd somebody when he actually fought someone of merit he fought Pedro Munoz and couldn't help himself but poking his eyes out. He fought Piotr Jan and it was a split decision. He barely got out of that. Um, and then what's the other one? He fought Cheeto and he flunked that test. You know, I'm not saying those are fights from the past. Like, yes, you're going to get older. You're going to get experience. You're going to get better. But in terms of what he's actually done, I mean, like, I'm only calling it how I see it. He's got a long, tough hill to climb. And if he thinks cutting the line to get there is going to hide those imperfections and those insecurities... I'm going to be that boogeyman on August 19th and I'm going to make him look at himself in the mirror and take a deep breath and realize you have to now face who you think that you are and you're going to have to see that reflection in the, in the version of Aljamain Sterling, you know? And that's just what it is. Again, like what he's done outside of that, personality, persona, that shit don't matter when the cage door locks. Yeah, good for him. I'm glad he's making money on YouTube. I'm glad his YouTube channel is doing well. Um, I would like to take some notes if I'm being honest. Uh, and and catch up to him but it seems like what people like about his channel and what they like about mine is like i'm giving you the realness he's giving you more like i don't even know him and of uh, red hawk over there i i don't know it's like if you want the real deal you come over to the real show you see what i'm saying if you want real insight you go to henry you go to myself you go to who else volkanovsky you go to real people who's actually giving you real value with him it just seems like more entertainment versus anything and even that entertainment factor for me is very subpar so i think the kids just like him because of the tattoos on his face and his hair is colored and he looks like a rebel it almost gives him like that oh he not he doesn't that's kind of how i want to live my life i can relate to this guy but that ain't the real life kids kids you're gonna have to eventually grow up and get a real job <laughs> you know so unless you're gonna come to mma and start fighting hey Hey, to each his own. That's all I can say. I'm not hating on the guy. Go get your money, Sean. I hope we both make a lot of money together. But at the end of the day, I'm coming in there to do one thing, and that's to smash the f this guy. Yeah, when I spoke to Henry about breaking this fight down, he said it's you know it's gonna be very very easy for you. He he sees that you just take him down, ground and pound, and it's done in like you know within the first round. Is that how you potentially see this fight playing out? I think that's the difference between Henry and I. You know, as as well accomplished as he is, he calls fights easy. I don't call any fight easy. The last time I called a fight easy, I was staring up at the ceiling and I didn't come to my senses until I woke up in the hospital and that was against Marlon Moraes. And ever since then, what happened? You know what I mean? You know, I was good before, but I think that just kind of awoken me to a new level. Like, you got to respect everybody. And that's why I respect Sean's game. I know what he brings to the table, but I think on paper, 
I bring a completely nightmare stylistic matchup to him. And it's up to me to go out there and make sure that happens. Yeah, I should be able to go out there and just walk him down, take him down. But that's not the game. He's got really good footwork. He's really long and lanky. He's actually got a longer reach than I do. He's taller. The difference is, though, just like Sanhagen and a guy like Jimmy Rivera, Henry Sayudo, short and compact, harder to get underneath them and take them down versus a guy who's tall and lengthy. It's more so me slipping, covering up, taking a shot or two, getting inside, closing that distance, getting my hands locked, and then from there just folding them. And I think that's that's the game plan. But again, easier said than done. He's got really good footwork. And if you ever try to shoot on someone who's moving, it's extremely difficult. So I got to make sure I'm not running into anything. But again, if I do my homework, I see the feints coming and I draw out his attack the right way, or he freezes up and second guesses himself and allows me to close that gap. Yeah, that's just a short night. I was going to ask, how is the the weight cut to 135 these days? Because every time I see you, you're looking more ripped, more jacked, more muscular, more, you look stronger physically every time you step into the cage. How how much longer do you think you can sustain a career at bantamweight before you have inevitably have to move up? Uh, I'm going to say win or learn, this is probably my last fight at bantamweight. So you're getting the good, you're getting the scoop on that first. Um more than likely is, and it's not, if I, even if I were to learn and I didn't get my hand raised, it, it damn sure. And because of Hen, uh, Sean O'Malley running me out of the division, it's more so getting old, man. It, it hurts. You think I wouldn't like to just turn around, but like, yeah, I could turn around and go fight 145 and go fight three months, three and a half months later, which is pretty much what this fight is. You know what I mean? Uh, it's the weight cut and it's kind of disingenuous and kind of, um, Kind of a, I'm going to call it what it is, a real tactic to want to say openly to people like, yeah, I know that weight cut's going to be hard for him to turn around and do it again that fast. And I know he's still going to be banged up coming into this one. So yeah, we, we know it's going to be a tough fight, but we know th these things going in. That's some real If it's me, I want to fight you at your best. Not when I can feel like I could get you when you're weak. Yeah. Some people might say it's smarter to do that. Yeah, it is tactically. But you get no respect for that. And if you go out there and get smashed, even having those advantages going in, bro, you should reevaluate your career and see what you really want to do. You know what I mean? So that's my mentality going in. You want to take the, the easy road and, and try to be a little b to get somebody in there faster um, because you know you're going to have those, those advantages because I just came out of a really tough fight with Henry. I banged up myself beating the crap out of Henry more than he's did to me. You know, So Henry's over here jumping at the bit. Ah, if he doesn't want to fight, I'll jump in undercutting me and trying to be like this hero when all it does is make you look weak. You 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 take away any I, I I'm not even gonna go into that, but he's doing himself a disservice by saying that. And I, I'll just leave it at that. Henry going out there and saying, throwing his let the opportunity come. Don't don't start running your mouth and saying things that you don't need to say because at the end of the day, the only person that you hurt is yourself. But I'll leave, I'll leave that at that and let people kind of take their time and use their brain to kind of figure out what that means. But um, yeah, this like I said, when I learned, this is probably more than likely my last one at bandwidth. That's and then huge. Marab could go out there and terrorize everybody. For sure. I know you got, you know, Marab waiting in the wings, but that's huge. And I was going to say like, you know, February of 2024 will be 10 years, a decade for you in the UFC. And, you know, you've been competing in this weight class for such a long time. So to kind of put that caveat onto this fight, in Boston, I think is huge because ultimately you get through Sean O'Malley, you're looking at the, the featherweight champion, right? And it could be Volkanovski, it could be Yair, but would you want to go into a situation where you get past Sean and you can actually go for double champ status or would it just be a case of, okay, cool, I'm going to now drop this you know championship and kind of move up to, to featherweight and make that my permanent home? Uh, when you put it like that, I just gotta, I guess I kind of gotta see how every, I guess I kind of got to see how everything plays out and then go about it like that versus just saying what it is. You know, it's, it's good to have a plan, but at the end of the day, man, when you get in these fights, you just never know what's really going to happen. Ideally, I was looking to fight in September, October. Uh, I was hoping September possibly turn around and fight in December and do something really, really special. But, uh, you never know what's going to happen when you get into these fights, man. I'm getting older. I've had about six surgeries now. Uh, you can hear on the broadcast, these guys keep constantly talking about my neck. 
Uh, even though my neck, yeah, I still have my neck pains, but I do wish people wouldn't put so much emphasis on that because it almost looks like a crutch and I don't want a crutch whether I win or lose. Um, so with that being said, yeah, it'd be easier to make the way not have to put so much wear and tear on my body. And this could be twofold. Sometimes people think when you cut more weight, you have to work harder. Uh, I think it's a little twofold for me where I won't, I, I'm still big enough where I'll, I'm going to cut a sizable amount of weight still to get to 145. It's just going to be a little bit easier, 10 pounds easier, which is a night and day difference. And it will allow me some opportunity to actually lift, get stronger, um, maybe not need to put as much wear and tear on the body, which could be good and bad, like I just said. So I, I don't know. And this is the way I analyze and break things down. You just never know what people are doing when they're making these adjustments. And if I do it, I want to make sure I'm doing it the right way. What, what do you walk around at? This morning, I was 66 and a half, which is pretty good. I'm slimming down from 170. And I, I, I got like four abs in there. I kind of see some, some little ripple effects in there a little bit. It's not quite like a like a washing machine, a board washer yet, but, uh, you know, a couple of weeks of training and we'll be back. And what do you make of the matchup? You know, obviously your, your future is going to be at featherweight, you know, one way or another. So when you look at a matchup between Volk and Yair, how do you kind of break that down? And, you know, would you ideally, you know, down the road, like to have the fight with Volkanovsky, who is now arguably the greatest featherweight of all time? I mean, it'd be cool in terms of name value, I guess, at this point in both their careers. But in terms of the, the more dangerous fight, man, if you know anything about MMA, you know anything about kicks, that Yair guy, he, that's that's the one. That's the dangerous fight. Even like I look at it, I know my coach and I were talking about it, and uh, he was saying he thinks that's an easy fight. I'm like, I know, bro. He knows how to fight off of his back now. He's not letting you just take him down and hang out. He's doing damage from his back. He's throwing up submissions from his back. He can kick. He could be free on the feet, knowing if he gets to the ground, he can still have success there. Versus before when he had those fights with Frank Yeager, he got taken down. It, it just, you know, obviously wasn't good. But now, man, you get one of those kicks to the body, that could be game over. One of those spinning kicks to the head, to the face, lights out. Um, more so where... Volkanovski is more so boxing with you. You see that so often, but when you get a special kicker, ah, man, that's that's just dangerous, you know? So um, I think even for myself, that's why people have a lot of issue with me because they're not used to someone coming in and kicking as much as I do. Now you look at Yair, it's me fighting almost a similar version of myself without the high-level transitioning grappling, but he's still dangerous, you know? So um, if there was a preference... With that being said, hey, man, I go into the fight not to take damage. I go into the fight to go out there, get in, get out, try to come out as unscathed as possible so I can have longevity in this. And if I'm talking the least threatening in terms of danger, like, yeah, Volk can knock me out. But we're talking about boxing versus kickboxing. I would much rather fight the guy who's going to predominantly just box and throw inside leg kicks. Like, the guy who's going to be doing jumping wheel kicks, jumping switch kicks, and could put my lights out that's the more dangerous and scarier fight versus the other guy where you know what you're kind of getting. It's just, he does at such a high level, which is why he's one of the best. And there's no slight to either one of those guys. It's just, I'm like I said, calling it how I see it. And this is how I got to where I am today. Cause I'm, I'm real about my assessments and what I'm looking at. Man, you get past Sean and you know, you move up to featherweight and you win and get that result and that get that fight by the end of the year. I think we're talking now, Jermaine Sterling fighter of the year, 2023. I mean, three three results, three wins in two different weight classes. One against, you know, another, you know, goat in the game and, and a former double champion in Henry Cejudo. This could be an incredible year for you. Um, I wanted to ask you about Chris Weidman, who's just recently announced that he's making a comeback. And as someone that's kind of seen him a lot in the gym, is a friend in, in the same team there, to see him transition from a... a one of the most in insane injuries we've seen in the sport and to see him come back and put in the hours in the gym to the point where he can now finally make a return back to the octagon. What's that been like for you? Uh, and what's it been like to, to kind of go through that with him as a friend and also a teammate? Uh, it's, it's cool to see. I mean, it's, it's never easy, you know, um, I can never relate to that type of an injury and coming back from something like that. Yeah. Like I had the neck injury and it was something that I thought my career was going to be over for, over with due to that and 
it's inspiring to see someone of his caliber come back and a big dude and still at that age who still wants to chase that dream, you know? And it's not like he's fighting like some slouch. He's fighting Brad Tavares, who's been around forever and a tough dude. He's training with a good camp and extreme couture. And uh, very nice family guys, both of these guys. But yeah, Bob, Chris, it, it's cool to see, man. It, um, I'm pulling for him. Obviously, I like Brad as well, but this is someone I grew up with in this space who gave me the opportunity to come down and train. So, of course, I'm going to have to go with my guy and roll with my guy. Um, we've got some really good memories with each other and the family and things like that and Chris Wyman. So, made the best man win, but I definitely think Chris has all the tools in the world to become a world champion again. It just really, it's all up here. And we've spoken about that. And um, I think as time has gone on, some of the things that he used to do, he's gotten back to. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to show that in that Uriah Hall fight. And hopefully he gets to show that brilliance in this fight with Brad Tavares. I'm looking forward to it. And um, with that being said, hopefully that injury is behind him and he can move on to competing a couple more times before it's all said and done. And he could ride off the way he wants to ride off into the sunset instead of being kind of forced into that. Absolutely. Earlier on, you mentioned the YouTube channel, The Weekly Scraps. I'm a big fan of fighters building their own brand on social media, especially on YouTube, and just building something that is going to stay with you post your fight career. When did the idea uh, come to you to actually put the time, money, investment, and energy into the YouTube channel? And what's the journey been like for you so far there? Uh, the journey's been cool. Uh, I started this, what was it, 2018, I think after Ally Quinta fought Kevin Lee. What was that, 2019? One of the two. And it's been a couple of years now. I started in my car, just kind of BSing a little bit. But I do have a passion and, and, and enjoyment of watching the fights and then breaking them down and kind of giving an inside look from a professional standpoint. And of course, back then, I wasn't where I am now in terms of ranking and accolades and the things I've accomplished to date. So I think now... It holds a little bit more water when I'm saying stuff. I think people are starting to go like, okay, this guy actually knows what the hell he's talking about. And that, and with that being said, I take sequences away from the fights, things that I like, and I'll record it, I'll break it down, and I'll bring it back and I'll teach it in the MMA wrestling class that we would do back at Law in uh, Long Island. And while I'm here in Vegas, since I don't necessarily have like a main gym, I'm more so training at the PI. You know, I bounce around at... at Extreme Couture and Syndicate when certain days, certain type of training, um, 10th Planet. I'll try to use those situations for myself and get my own type of work in and try to rep some of those things as well. Because you can always learn from even the younger guys and get in different type of scenarios and sequences and things like that. So when you do that, you're always constantly learning, you're constantly growing. I think it's made me a better fighter. It's made me a better coach. And that's mainly been the premise behind it. Now we actually make a little bit of money from it, which is cool. You know, I'm not going to say no to money, free money, you know, for something I'm already doing and I enjoy doing. So with that being said, that's been the, the main purpose behind the platform. I love it. And speaking of breaking down fights, I'd love to get your thoughts on Jake Paul versus Nate Diaz in the boxing ring. One of the biggest fights of the summer. Um, how do you see that fight playing out? And do you, do you give Nate a chance against Jake? So Jake and I actually spoke about this on his show, his podcast. And I didn't really get, I haven't had the opportunity to break down the fight yet, stylistically, from the last few performances. Obviously, we know Nate's a lot older. He's coming in a lot smaller. For the most part, he's a smaller guy compared to Jake. I, I saw Jake over the weekend. He's a big dude, man. The guy was like 6'3", 6'4", pushing over, I would say, at least 215, maybe 220. He's a pretty solid dude. Um Nate used to be a 55er, came up to welterweight towards the end of his career. So when we just look at the little intangible things like that, that's like, it, it makes it more, I don't want to say, you could see the edge naturally going towards Jake, even though he might not be as seasoned and as uh, skilled, but size does matter. And on a short version of things, I think the longer the fight goes, I think you're going to start to see Nate come on a little bit more. But Nate's going to have to weather an early storm from a younger guy who's going to be trying to stay long, utilize that reach advantage. I I'm pretty sure he has a reach advantage going to this, or it's relatively equal. Uh, I think Nate does have some pretty long arms. But again, you're talking about the pop from the punches of Jake versus the volume of Nate. And that could be the difference. You know, so 
just looking at it like that without going back and reviewing their past few fights. Jake looked okay against Tommy Fury, where Nate's a better boxer by trade based on what we've seen over the years. And again, Father Time is undefeated. So with just that being said, I think it's kind of hard to count Jake out of this one. But it would be good for the MMA world for Nate to get the dub. Everybody wants to see Nate win. I want to see Nate win. I'm a big represent Army fan, Diaz Army fan. You know, those guys were pioneers of the sport. And uh, Jake knows what he's doing, man. He's picking the right matchups, man. He's trying to get himself these these right spots and position himself to win for success and catapult his name off of names that are already big, even though he was already a big name himself. But he's doing it the right way strategically. But, you know, it'd be cool to see an upset or at least a competitive fight. I just don't want to see Nate get rolled over because of the size. It'd be nice to see Nate come out there and represent and go out there and do his thing and uh, put on a good show. That was a hell of a breakdown. I love it. Um, just a couple more things and we're going to wrap it up here and I appreciate the time that you're given. Um, I saw that you're thinking about uh, or the ball has started to roll in the right direction in terms of you having your own rum. Is that true? Yeah. So we got a couple of samples that we already did. Um, we're just trying to revamp a couple of things. You know, there's some small details. You know, I can have it be Caribbean rum and be ready to go for the next fight, like some samples out ready to roll out. But I want it to be purely Jamaican rum. And I don't know if that matters too much to the masses, as long as it's a good product. But to me, I kind of want it to be more endearing to my heart, where it's more authentic to my background. Like Connor's got his thing, it's Irish whiskey, you know? I want this to be Jamaican rum, you know? So if I can get it that way, it's just more of a production situation and how long we're willing to wait versus kind of having it majority Jamaican rum, but have some other blends for some other Caribbean islands and having it ready to go on the shelves in let's say two months kind of thing. So that's kind of what we're kicking around right now. We're trying to figure out the logistics of that and see how we can get that settled and see what we can do. Cause we might have to do a limited run, but it would be cool to see what the interest would be like if we did a limited run and see if there's anything we need to tweak going forward um, but that's where we're at. So, so far, so good. I'm actually, I was really impressed with the samples that we had before and actually got another batch coming in, uh, hopefully by this weekend that I could try and see what else we got in terms of quality. You know, and the main thing I'm doing is I'm trying it cold. I'm trying it warm and I'm trying it with a little bit of a chaser to kind of get an idea of what the vibe would be like, making sure it's something that you can enjoy in all stages on the rocks, neat, or, um, with a well drink. And you want to make sure you appeal to as broad of a mass as you can. Because rum is one of the more healthier drink choices. I don't know if people know that. When people actually do the research and look it up, go see for yourself. Look what the pirates used to drink back in the day. What people used to drink back in the Caribbean islands all day long. Um, molasses, one of the more he healthier things that you can put in your body in terms of natural sugars. So if you're looking for something good that can actually help with the cold and things like that, rum is your choice. So I'm going to make sure we have a good a good batch ready for you guys. It's, uh, the name is Funk Harbor. So definitely be on the lookout for that. And uh, I'm going to keep everyone posted when it's get closer to actually being like a done deal kind of thing. Well, when you have the samples, please do send up some to Toronto so I can, uh, you know, <laughs> try a little bit as well. Speaking of Jamaica, by the way, like ha have you and Leon got a relationship or a friendship? I'm just thinking you've got two guys here in the UFC, two champions of <laughs> Jamaican descent. I'm surprised that there hasn't been more of a media or PR tour, whether it be from the UFC or from, I don't know, a sports minister in Jamaica to organize it. And is there maybe a potential to actually have a UFC event in Jamaica? I think he wins and then I win. I think it's going to be very, very hard to deny that, you know. Um, we haven't done too much. He was in Dubai when I was in Dubai getting ready for my fight against TJ Dillashaw. And we got to train a little bit. He got to sit alongside. He watched a bit. I watched him hit pads a little bit. He got to watch me do some flow sparring and, and some uh, shark tank drills just to kind of get the sweat, lose the weight. And uh, whenever we see each other, it's love. But, you know, he's busy. I'm busy. I think when you got two guys who are on a mission, it's less about trying to see when we can link up and more about like, how do we stay here kind of thing. It'll be cool if we could kind of cut out some time, but very different schedules, different parts of the world. So it's not as easy as it may seem, especially when you don't know when you're going to fight again. People are just kind of just rushing you back in there. So you don't really get to enjoy that downtime, so to speak. But yeah, that's that's more so the way things are right now. So I, I don't think it's anything like 
not liking each other. We, you know, we've seen each other multiple times taking pictures and whatnot. It's just more so timing of things. Amazing. Aljo, the way I like to end all my interviews and my conversations is something I like to call the bit for social. I know you've been to London. I know the, you know, the, the London vernacular. So I'm going to throw out a, a bunch of different questions and options. And all you can respond with is yes, bruv or nah, bruv. All right. All right. Number one, fighting in New Jersey again. Yes, bruv. Fighting in Madison Square Garden, New York. Yes, bruv. Fighting in Jamaica. Yeah, bruv. White rum. Yes, bruv. Dark rum. Yes, bruv. Rematch with Henry Cejudo. Ooh. Nah, bruv. <laughs> and finally, fighting for the UFC featherweight championship by the end of 2023. Yes, bruv. Aljo, you're the man. Good luck with the fight against Sugar Sean O'Malley in Boston. I can't wait. Good luck with the weekly scraps. Good luck with the rum. You're an entrepreneur. You're doing big things. You're you know, one of the greatest, if not one of the greatest, bantamweight fighters, but also fighters, period, that we've had in the UFC. And um, I just can't wait to see what happens uh, when you take on Sugar Sean O'Malley and then beyond that as well. So thanks again for your time. And we'll speak to you soon. Thank you, bro. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. It really means a lot to me. And hey, listen, if you enjoyed this episode, please go and give it a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows.